Hello and welcome everyone to this new episode. It's no surprise that projects are rarely perfect on the first try. This is especially true in storytelling. You might start with a grand vision filled with numerous ideas and directions for various elements. However, as you develop your world and craft your narrative adjustments or cuts often become necessary to align everything cohesively. This is especially common in video games and today's topic, the story of Doom 3, is a very good example. The version we know today underwent significant changes from its original conception. I came across these details in The Making of Doom 3 by Stephen L. Kent. This book is incredible. It covers not only the story aspects, but also reveals lots of the technical challenges faced during the game's development, and also with intriguing behind-the-scenes insights. So without further ado, let's dive in, and especially, Thank you for stopping by. Now here's for you, the original story of Doom 3. Hey, Corporal, I heard you got transferred to Mars City. <laughs> They'd hum Rocket Man by Elton John. Everyone thought he was the first to come up with it. I never laughed. Finding out that I got the 150 million mile transfer to Mars City sucked the humor right out of me. But I didn't blame the other guys for joking around. We knew someone was going to Mars, and they were relieved when they found out it wasn't them. Had I not gotten the nod, I might have been singing too. Right from the start, players are greeted with a departure from the silent protagonist traditionally associated with Doom. While still presented in a first-person perspective, the introduction of the Marine's thought diverges from the game's foundational elements at the heart of Doom's allure is the immersive experience of stepping into the Marine's boots, thrust into direct, intense combat with demons. Considering the initial criticisms of the game's slow pacing, introducing the Marine who participates in dialogue could have further heightened worries about the game's speed. The initial story introduction also gives us more context, showing the Marine on the transport ship alongside Swan and Campbell. Normally, you transferred up with a squad of Marines. I got a UAC lawyer and a UAC security goon. They didn't care for my company either. They sat in the front of the cabin. I sat in the back. Elliot Swan, the lawyer, kept gabbing on about contracts and legal issues. The UAC can't afford to brush this off. If the word gets out that we're bending the rules... Jack Campbell, Mr. Security, tried to ignore him mostly. He grunted every now and then. I wouldn't have known if Campbell was alive if he didn't grunt every so often. They won't be forgiving. The guy had the feel of a mercenary, somebody who liked killing too much to join an army. Armies have rules about when and where to kill. Campbell reminded me of a bayonet in an undersized scabbard. His sharp edges were covered, but barely. Swan, who was undoubtedly Albert friggin Einstein in a courtroom, lacked the social intelligence to know he was tempting death. Swan underwent significant changes. He was originally portrayed more as an irritating lawyer rather than the confident character we see in the final version. Campbell's portrayal was also notably altered, showing annoyance towards Swan rather than the unwavering loyalty of a man who chooses to stay by his side out of dedication, not solely due to commands. Making Swan more authoritative and less bothersome not only intensified the conflict with Betruga during their brief encounters, but also sought to strengthen the player's bond with him when it is revealed that his intentions were noble. Apparently having a desk job gets you right through security in this burg. Welcome to Mars City. Union Aerospace. One moment I saw Swan and Campbell standing behind me. Then I felt a tingle run down my spine and turned to see this creepy looking science guy staring down from an overhead observation deck. You didn't have to hang around Mars City very long before the paranoia became contagious. The geek with the lab coat and the manhole-sized glasses wasn't watching me. He was watching stacks of crates marked confidential. Maybe it was the transfer or the shock of finding myself stuck in a tin can on a hostile planet. I could feel my heart pounding. The guy didn't even notice me staring at him. All he cared about was his boxes. When the player first entered Mars City, the original sequence was much longer. He was required to undergo blood sampling, answer questions, receive a briefing from the receptionist, and then proceed to his quarters to drop off his bag himself. However, this entire process was significantly streamlined, 
retaining only classified cargo details on panels, simplifying the introduction with a bioscan, and the receptionist instructing the player to leave his bag and head directly to Command HQ. Additionally, a chapel scene was entirely removed. It was meant to introduce the concept of visions experienced by Marines on the base, a motif related to the ancient Martian civilization that would resurface later in the game. Attention, Director Banks, please report to Central Administration. As I passed in office, I heard a familiar voice and caught a quick glimpse as I walked by. Elliot Swan was reading the riot act to an officer, a general. It could only be Mars City Commander General Hayden. Only Hayden didn't look like a post commander at this moment. He looked mad and dangerous, like a drill sergeant tolerating a reprimand from some new, just out of school jerk lieutenant. I don't like the way you're running these experiments. And you think you corporate sobs can do a better job, right? Don't answer that. I knew that kind of question. It was worse than rhetorical. Damn right we could do a better job. That was my cue to leave. The lawyer was about to learn a thing or two about Marine Corps civility. As the new guy on base, I would probably get sent to hose down the lawyer's remains. We were quickly introduced to a character now completely removed from the story, General Hayden. He was intended to be the head of the military on Mars, coordinating the experiments with Betruga to ensure his Marines' interests were always prioritized. Hayden was designed to turn malevolent shortly after the beginning of the invasion and was to be the catalyst for Sergeant Kelly's downfall. Many actions and decisions attributed to Betruga in the final game were initially performed by Hayden. The choice to exclude Hayden aimed to spotlight Betruga as the primary antagonist from the start, establishing his villainy and leaving Swan as the sole figure of ambiguity. Miller, you hear about Corporal Allen? When I arrived at the barracks, I got a nice surprise. The place was darker and a bit more cramped than I was used to, but the boys were just like the jarheads back home. You're the new recruit? Report to my office immediately. I have a job for you. Yes, Sergeant. Is this the kind of operation where they give the crappy details to the new guys? Ha, yeah, that's pretty much how it works around here. <laughs> These were the kinds of jerks who hummed Rocket Man back on Earth. I gave them the one-finger salute. They gave it back to me. Semper Fi. A significant part of the story remains the same where the player, after getting briefed by Kelly, sets out to locate the missing scientist. This is also where we'd encounter the chapel scene, depicting a vision where a figure engulfed in flames wanders the corridors. It serves as a revelation that such visions weren't isolated incidents, but were in fact being also experienced no, by no, other Marines. You must let me get this communication out. He had his finger in the trigger guard, but it's just sitting there, not actually wrapped around the trigger. He let the gun sag in and out of range as he spoke. This was good. He did not intend to shoot me. This did not mean that I was safe. The fool barely even realized he had a gun in his hand. He was precisely the kind of civilian who shoots you even when he didn't mean to. His hand twitches or he hears a loud sound and jumps and bang. His eyes were wide open, puffy and red, and underlined with purpled skin bags. Sweat glistened on his face, but I could still make out the tracks along his cheeks. The guy was convulsing, practically imploding before my eyes. I took a slow step forward. If I could get close enough, maybe snatch the gun before he knew what hit him. If things could stay sane. No loud noises. <laughs> Suddenly, the communication system in my helmet came online. I heard men shouting and firefight. There was a battle going on, but it didn't sound like much of a battle. Whoever had entered the base was shutting down the Marines in quick order. Upon the portal's opening, instead of Jonathan Ishii transforming into a zombie, he chooses to end his own life. This action was indented to signify his awareness of the impending doom and his preference to die rather than face the aftermath. In the initial draft, the Marine's inaugural confrontation with a zombie was set to unfold upon his return to Mars City, marked by an episode where a janitor, mirroring the appearance of a fat zombie, advances towards the Marine. This sequence, dramatic in its depiction, 
would have illustrated the janitor absorbing numerous shots before succumbing. Marines headquarters was the worst. Some of the guys tried to make a stand here. Whatever hit them, it bulldozed right through them. The guy I flipped off on my way to Sergeant Kelly sat against the wall as if taking a siesta. But when I approached him for a closer look, I saw that his head was turned clear around with his chin slumped between his shoulder blades. Video Sergeant link Kelly up called requested. to me from a monitor overlooking this mess. Video link up requested. Connection established. They're dead. Every last one of them. I found a few survivors so far. There are ten of us, including you. Look, Corporal, we need to radio for help. We've been hit hard. Whoever did this is still here. We're going to need reinforcements before we can stop them. Before... before they get what they came for. Have you seen them? What are they? I don't know. It looks like it was an inside job. I just capped a couple of guys I recognized. Scientists from the Alpha Labs. Me too. The janitor. Son of a bitch must have been on PCP or worse. Took five shots to drop him. Drugs? Yeah, that would explain a lot. The guys I saw looked like they didn't have an ounce of blood in their veins. They moved slow and stiff. We're meeting up in the main communications center. If we can get the message out, maybe we can dig in until reinforcements arrive. I signed off and took one last look around HQ. A lot of good men died here. Would anybody remember them? Would anybody ever know what happened? After getting in contact with Kelly, the Marine is requested to head directly to the communication center instead of being tasked to meet with Bravo team. The squad was not originally part of his mission. It was added to provide stronger motivation to reach the communication center and to increase the burden on the player after the squad's demise. No, I understand everything. I'm telling you now. We observe a similar exchange between Swan and Betruga, again depicting the lawyer more eccentric, raising his voice instead of speaking calmly. Up until that stage in this version of the story, the player had not acquired the shotgun until they came across the injured Marine. Recognizing its importance, developers chose to equip players with the iconic weapon much earlier. This encounter with the dying man also unveils the first hint of Hayden's betrayal. They're all dead. They said this place was secure. It was an ambush. Don't trust anybody. Do you hear me? Nobody. Hating myself for doing it, I commandeered the dead Marine's weapon, pulled it right out of his limp hands and pulled the extra shells from his belt. That turned out to be a good choice. The monitor over the door to the Alpha Lab said that the area was sealed by direct order of William Banks. I never met Banks, but I recognized the name. He was the director of this little funhouse. Dead or alive, I needed his help if I wanted to get out of here. A detailed scene set in a library area was removed, but would have introduced information about the ancient Martian civilization much earlier. A decision made to instead convey this information through PDA audio logs and videos. Following the iconic encounter with the Pinky Demons, which remained largely unchanged from the version we know, the Marine makes his way to Betruga's office. The storm had hit really hard here. Tables, chairs and equipment lay overturned. Glass walls were shattered. Most of the offices were dark, but a strange red glow illuminated from beneath the door at the end of the hall. I approached slowly, shotgun ready. The hall was mostly dark, but that eerie red glow filled this small corner. And I could read the name on the door. Dr. Malcolm Betruger. I knew that name. He was the one Swan was yelling at. Swan didn't like him, and as far as I was concerned, that made Betruger one of the good guys. The question was, which one was he? When I opened the door, I saw a sight that would haunt me as long or as short as I lived. That glowing red light came from the glowing red pentagram that had been burned into the floor. Five corpses lay spread-eagled outside of the circle, one at each corner of the star. These men were not only killed, they were gutted. Their agonized faces were left intact, but their torsos were torn open and picked clean. Below the shoulders, their bodies were little more than emptied rib cages. 
William Banks PDA reveals extensive details about Petruga's frequent journeys through the portal, information Ian McCormick shares in the final game. We would have also learned about Petruga's true nature, depicting him as a theologian rather than a scientist. This scene connects to an earlier moment when Betruger inspected cargo he had received, later revealed to contain religious artifacts. While Hell was initially accessible only through the portal opened in the Alpha Lab, Betruger must have used these artifacts and the sacrifices to enable Hell to send creatures without using the main gate, employing these summoning portals to dispatch demons more swiftly. As I passed through the Alpha area, I noticed movement in one of the labs. I moved in for a closer look and saw a scientist twiddling knobs on some kind of high-tech console. He turned to look at me and smiled when he saw that I was human. Thank God, am I glad to see you. I, I thought you might be another one of those monsters. That's why I locked the door. You're going to need to do more than lock the doors. I've seen some of those things bust right through walls. You can't stay here. You're a sitting duck in this glass box. I can't leave. Somebody placed a virus in the computers. This console is the only thing keeping our systems up. If I leave it, we'll lose power and life support. You're dead either way. Are there any other stations you can use? Like maybe one in a room with fewer windows? <laughs> I'm not worried about myself. I'm an old man, and I've seen more than I care to see already. My assistant is out there. I'll keep the systems running as long as I can. What I really need is for you to go find her. I'm on my way to the communication center. I've got... That's perfect. She's on the way. She can help you. She's an engineer. Look, I'm not going looking for your lost assistant. You may not have noticed, but I have a war on my hands. Just... just keep your eye out for her. That's all I ask. Please. The elderly man, identified as Blackwell, but possibly recognized in the final game as George Crippman, requests the Marine to keep an eye out for his assistant, a woman we now know as Teresa Chassar. Always clear. There's nothing here, Sam. What the hell? The Marine stumbles upon the scene just as Bravo team is caught in a desperate standoff, surrounded by a swarm of demons. Witnessing the slaughter firsthand, he watches as the squad is overwhelmed. During the chaos, a stray bullet is fired, setting off a chain reaction that culminates in the reactor component explosion. I entered an administrative area and heard the sound of a woman crying. It was not a sad cry, but rather the sound of helplessness. I moved through the lobby, ignoring the dead scientists that lay crushed against the walls. The woman was hiding in an office curled up on the desk. What? No, no, stay away. You don't need to worry about me. I'm the good guys. You're the missing assistant. Blackwell told me about you. Told me to look for you. He's alive? Alive and refusing to leave his workstation. He's locked himself in with his computers. Says there's a virus in the system and that he's the only one who can keep the system running. Uh, yeah. That's... that's Blackwell. Okay, so now that we know we're on the same side, what do those sirens mean? It's coming from the antimatter chamber. Something must have happened to the cooling rods. Just for the fun of it. To pretend you're dealing with a big dumb marine who doesn't know anything about cooling rods or antimatter chambers. There won't be much left of Mars if we don't shut that off. How about a problem are we talking about? The Mars City part will survive, right? The entire planet will be destroyed. I know how to get to the chamber. Follow me. Teresa accompanies the marine to replace a vital reactor component. While not specified, this could mirror the game level where the player must safeguard Dr. Edward through the dark areas of Delta Lab Sector 2. During their journey, the Marine begins to tragically realize something is amiss with Teresa. Upon achieving their objective, the sequence reaches his haunting climax with the introduction of the lost soul. Let's get to the communications facility. We can start the transmission from there. Whatever you say, Counselor. The Marine arrived at the communication center, with Swan urging not to send the message. After choosing or not to send the message, this segment would also introduce Ian McCormick. Wh who are you? I'm part of the Marine detachment. But, but I thought you were all... <sighs> dead. They got most of us. They got just about everybody. How did you survive? I... I was in here. The lab walls are armor-plated. Some monsters tried to get in, but they gave up after a while. Is that a teleportation device you're working on? 
Is it operational? The power inducer is broken. It needs a new one. I see. Do you have another one in that lab? Okay, if I find a power inducer for you, will you let me in so I can use your machine? <sighs> Alright, yes. Get me a power inducer, and I will teleport you. You wouldn't happen to have any suggestions on where I might find that inducer? Power inducer? We kept them in the second lab. Do you know where that is? I've picked up a lot of PDAs during my exploration of the base, most belonging to recently murdered scientists. From having read these PDAs, I had a pretty good idea about the Primar and Secon labs, and a strong desire to avoid them. Primar was short for Primary Experimentation Lab. One scientist jokingly referred to it as the Primate Experimentation Lab on his PDA, a scientist with a sense of humor. Wonder if he ever heard the song Rocket Man. The commandos are introduced, along with a scene reminiscent of one in the Doom movie, featuring, as odd as it may sound, demonized possessed monkeys that would have attacked the Marine and could have become recurrent enemies. <laughs> After acquiring the power inducer, the Marine returns to Ian McCormick and for the first time steps into a teleporter. This moment triggers his initial vision, unveiling glimpses of the Soul Cube, the infernal landscapes of hell and the remnants of an ancient Martian civilization. I entered the lab and found myself in a long hallway lined with gigantic glass tubes. They were display cases. They held dead demons, thousands of them. Some of the cases were broken, as if whatever they once held had woken up and busted its way out. Beyond the Demon Museum, I found an autopsy room. This place was the real chamber of horrors, complete with metal racks on which creatures were strapped and possibly skinned alive. The experimentation had probably continued right up to the apocalypse. There were freshly eviscerated bodies on some of the tables. Organs lay in a stack beside a hallowed out creature. In earlier drafts, Scenes depicted General Hayden turning a Marine into a commando and destroying a bridge, actions that, in the final release, were attributed to Betruga. And now things got even more bizarre. As I slipped down the hall, a couple of demon commandos appeared around the next corner. With my shotgun ready, I had no trouble dispatching them. But there were more of them around the next bend, and even more a bit farther ahead. Either this floor of the complex was completely flooded with demons, or someone was watching me and sending goons to meet me. I started scanning the ceiling and noticed security cameras everywhere. It was actually kind of funny, you know? Somewhere there was a zombie or some other kind of imp manning a security console and charting my every move. If this was true, all I had to do was avoid the security cameras, and the commandos would go away. And it was true. Next thing I knew, I had the halls to myself, more or less. I even found my undead security guard. I'd lost him temporarily, but I needed to go in there and kill him once and for all. That was going to be a problem. Some kind of flesh seal had grown over the door. I could not tear it away, and I didn't dare shoot at it. Those demons were quite capable of homing in on sounds. Firing my gun was a dead giveaway. In the original draft, the game experimented with a stealth element requiring players to avoid camera detection, a departure from Doom's traditional fast-paced gameplay. Today, it's hard to imagine a protagonist in a Doom game hesitating to fire a weapon for fear of attracting monsters, as this goes against the series' hallmark of confronting threats head-on. Then I found Test Chamber 2 and another teleportation device. It was time to drop in on the security station and pay my respects. I programmed the computer, stepped into the chamber, and found myself flying through that familiar evil tunnel. And there was that black box again. Somehow. Somewhere. In the back of my mind, I even knew its name. It was the Soul Cube. I knew more than that. From the visions, I learned that there had been a civilization on Mars. An ancient one. Whoever had lived here before, they poured their very essence into that little black box, knowing that placing their souls in it would create a weapon that could shake the very foundations of hell. In this vision, however, the great weapon was destroyed. Betruger took that soul cube down to hell, where four great demons broke it into equal portions. The only hope for humanity was for me to go after those demons and reunite the soul cube. 
The Soul Cube, initially split into four parts guarded by Barons of Hell, with General Hayden as the intended Hell final encounter, underwent significant changes. The release version presents the artifact as intact, highlighting its power and importance with the Guardian as the ultimate Hell boss and Betruga as the primary antagonist. Upon returning from Hell with the Soul Cube, the Marine finds the base dramatically altered, overrun by the encroaching growth of Hell itself. The Soul Cube, envisioned differently than in the final version, required the defeat of ten demons to activate. There, leaning against the wall, was Swan. He'd been shot, wounded badly, and now he was dying. Just an hour earlier, I had hoped that I would get the honor of killing this creep. Now I knew more. Now I realized that he was one of the good guys all along. The wall behind him was smeared with blood and tissue. I could not see his chest since it was propped against his knees. I could see that his back was blown out. I could see the white stripe of his spine through sheds of skin and soggy cloth. The narrative leads to the confrontation with Kelly in a demonized state. Where are you hiding? It remained ambiguous whether he would appear in his sabayal guise or engage in combat, retaining more of his human characteristics. The concept of Sabaoth was envisioned with the premise that Kelly underwent a form of crucifixion, merged with a demon which was then integrated into a tank's structure. Initial portrayals of the sergeant suggested a zombified appearance, not the armored vehicle entity he later becomes. This implies he was either encountered in this form or it represented his state before being crucified and fused with the tank. I entered the dig site through the carved stone archway that I had seen in my visions. Things did not look as I had expected. Hell had infected this sacred spot along with every place else. Patches of flesh clung to the walls, covering many of the hieroglyphic writings. If Hell could pollute this spot, what hope was there? Beyond the dig site, I found a deep crater. The walls of the crater were almost completely consumed by flesh. Entering this hole was like climbing into an enormous human organ. And at the base of the organ, he waited for me. Malcolm Betruger. So you made it this far. The ultimate showdown was intended with Betruger. Whether the Cyberdemon was to play a role in this finale remains uncertain. Concept art for the Spider Mastermind presents a fascinating what-if scenario. Drawing parallels to Doom 2016's climactic battle, it's intriguing to consider the possibility of Betruga undergoing his transformation into a demon in front of the Marine, whether as the Maledict, or in this case, as the unused Spider Mastermind.